Hello everyone and welcome to the second installment of a three-part webinar series incorporating ESL into your library. My name is Natalie Dunaway and I'm the Continuing Education Coordinator with the Mississippi Library Commission. In this webinar we'll talk about developing a conversation class for English language learners and non-native English speakers in your community. So, what we'll talk about in this webinar is conversation classes, what they are, how to build a class, we'll talk a little bit about advertising, we'll run through some class ideas and activities and things to keep in mind. We'll also talk very briefly about building resources and cultivating resources you may already have. If having a regular ESL conversation class in your library is not something that you're able to manage at the moment, we'll talk about how we can create a small English language corner that you can develop over time and that any ELLs in your community can use for their own self-study. All right, so Conversation Classes 101. What constitutes as a conversation class? For this presentation, I'm going to use the term conversation class as an umbrella term to refer to any interactive ESL course or social hour that is not set up in the way of a traditional style class, but functions with a base goal of improving speaking and listening skills for its attendees. All right. So if you Google or you search on the internet for ESL conversation class or foreign language conversation class, what you'll probably find is a lot of different ingredients that make up a conversation class but no real hard and fast definition. If you do find one let me know and I'll go back and incorporate it in this. But typically conversation classes are student directed. There are you know instructors to facilitate and scaffold um, in a conversation class in the case that there's any communication breakdown or uh, an instructor wants to present an activity or present sort of a language topic, there's definitely facilitation happening, but typically conversation classes are free-flowing. They're a lot less structured and a bit less formal than a traditional style class, which would include like exams, a formal assessment, you know, following some sort of a curriculum, things like that. So the amount of direction that a facilitator will provide also depends on the speaking and listening levels of the attendees of a conversation class. And some things to keep in mind during this webinar, and I've mentioned it before, but I'll mention it again, content is always flexible. If you see something that you like and that you think would work for your library, but you need to take or add a few, um, a few ingredients, a few qualities to it, uh, take away, add a few features, feel free to do that. Content is flexible. Also, if you're interested in starting an ESL conversation class in your library, I highly encourage you to know that you want to do, to kind of have an idea of knowing what you want to do and to find out as much as you can about the community or communities that you're trying to reach out to. Do demographic research and find out what your communities need as best you can. Another thing to keep in mind is that um, if you are having a class of beginners um, who have only a very basic grasp of English, uh, your conversation class will require more instruction and review from you. It might require a little bit more preparation as well. This does not mean that you necessarily need to incorporate formal assessment like quizzes, tests, presentations, things like that, but you may need to be prepared to teach vocabulary, grammar points, etc. All right. So, how do I build a class? Well, I encourage you to think about the resources that you have in your library um, and what resources are you able to gain access to? What community partnerships do you have? What relationship do you have with your local schools who may have a number of English language learners or your local uh, other community centers like churches or YMCAs or anything like that? Um, so. Really think about the resources that you have and think out of the box. What resources can you build? Um, what kind of prep are you willing and can you do? What kind of preparation do you have time to do? You know, be realistic. Um, I encourage you to think of an ideal, think of a goal, but also be realistic in your approach. 
Think about the patrons you're trying to reach. Think about what you want your patrons to take away. Obviously, we want people to come and enjoy um, our libraries, but what kind of skills do you want to take away? Um, you know, do you want your conversation classes to be more social? Do you want it to be kind of more like a mixer style, sort of like meet and greets? Or do you want to introduce like formal grammar? What kind of information do you want to convey? Do you know if your community members need help with employment? So maybe you want to have your conversation classes kind of revolve around like uh, career enhancement terminology or career enhancement uh, exercises, things like that. If you know that you have a lot of, if you have a high immigrant population, maybe you want to do conversation classes that focus on like developing life skills like cooking and, you know, developing life skills like that. So think about what you want people to take away from your conversation class. Okay, so just so you know, a conversation class versus a traditional style class, they have different features. If your library is new to working with non-native English speaking populations, I recommend starting with a conversation class instead of a formal traditional style class, or really anything that requires registration. Uh, we'll talk about registration a little bit later. There are some pros and cons to registrations, and we'll get in registration, and we'll get into that. And also, how do you get people through the door? Um, well, keep in mind that the communities that you're trying to reach will determine how you advertise. And I always encourage call, call, call. Get on the phone. If you know a church or a community center or an adult education center that has a link to the communities that you're trying to reach, call them. Tell them about your program. Tell them about your ESL conversation class. Send them flyers. Go meet with them in person. You have to you have to represent yourself outside of your library. You have to call and you have to let people know, okay? Post and use social media. Also, there's no excuse on your Facebook posts today to not translate uh, your posts into, another language, into other languages. Use Google Translate. If you're trying to reach a large Spanish-speaking population, take your posts, translate it into Spanish, and post it on your Facebook. And also get to know your immigrant communities. What do they need? What are they searching for? What um, resources do they need? And they, what resources can you provide them, realistically? OK. All right, so this is a big list of uh, resources. Um, the title of uh, this document is called, We Welcome You to Welcome Everyone. Now, I got this from an American Libraries Magazine blog post. The link is down here under Get to Know Your Community. And this handout was made and is from Eva Raison. She is the outreach uh, coordinator with the Brooklyn Public Library. Now, this blog post um, refers to a, a talk, a conference, or a development, a workshop that was hosted in California. So you'll see a few. Um, links in here that are specific to California. But overall, these resources are great and can be used um, for any library in any community looking to sort of develop its understanding and develop its uh, outreach resources for how to, um, you know, really communicate and really out, you know, achieve outreach with the immigrant community. And I love this right here. Get to know your community. Think about demographics and neighborhood engagement. Check your statistics. What is the makeup of your community, of your county, of your city? Okay, and conduct outreach. Go to local ethnic grocery stores and small businesses. Like I said earlier, go to reach out to community-based organizations, community events, and local stores. And always keep in mind barriers that immigrants may face. You know, there's language constraints, there's cultural beliefs, the perception of public institutions. How do you guys come off? Fears of mistreatment and deportation, transportation constraints, work obligations, and communication preferences. So some of these barriers we'll get into a little bit with um, registration and some of the cons of registration for programs. But overall, check these resources out. And actually, um, if you are looking to understand uh, the statistics of like the population of your communities, I highly, highly recommend if you look over to the left here, there's demographic information, and the first bullet point is Data USA. We're going to go take a look at Data USA now. I'm going to show you how to use it, and it's great for giving you a snapshot of the makeup of the 
of the di diversity in your community. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen. Let's see here. Uh, da -da -da, share my screen. All right, and share my desktop. All right, so you guys should be seeing this blank Adobe Connect screen. So we're going to exit out of this, and we're going to go and take a look at Data USA. Okay, so this is Data USA, and it is really fantastic. I really, really like this, uh, this uh, resource. So let's say we want to know about the number of uh, non-English languages spoken in Mississippi. So let's see. Let's think of a place. Let's do, let's do Biloxi, Mississippi. Okay, so you type in your location up here, and you click on it when it comes up. All right, and this is just your quick snapshot of what's happening in Biloxi. Population of about 45,000 people, median age, median household income, median property value, number of employees, and the poverty rate, okay? So you can scroll, here is a little, there we go, a little about section, oop, my page is getting away from me, um, about Biloxi, yeah, let's just do it this way, okay, so we want to know about Biloxi, we want to know about, let's say, diversity. Let's take a look. Okay. Biloxi, Mississippi is home to a population of about 45,000 people, 96.3% are citizens, and the ethnic composition of the population of Biloxi is composed of about 27,000 white residents, about 10,000 black residents, and about 4,000 Hispanic residents. Okay? And it gives you sort of a snapshot on diversity, global diversity, the most common origin of... Um, most common uh, birthplace for foreign-born residents of Harrison County um, is Mexico, Vietnam, and Germany, but other relatively high origins are Eastern Africa, West Indies, and Bermuda. Okay? Citizenship rate, race and ethnicity. Aha, here we go. Non-English speakers. So, 4,792 of Biloxi, Mississippi citizens are speakers of a non-English language, which is lower than the national average. And some of the most common languages are Spanish, Vietnamese, and Tagalog. Other relatively high languages are Vietnamese, Thai, and Mon Khmer, which is Cambodian uh, language. So, now I want to make a little uh, side note here. Look at this phrasing. This number of citizens are speakers of a non-English language. Now, just as a side note, just because someone is a speaker of a non-English language doesn't necessarily mean that they don't speak English fluently. So, um, within this number, you may have a number of people who speak Vietnamese, who speak Spanish, who speak those languages fluently, but also who speak uh, English fluently as well. Um, so, your number of non-English speakers who maybe have um, less than proficient English speaking abilities will probably be just a little bit lower than this. Just keep that in mind. That just because someone is fluent in a language besides English um, and maybe is from a non-English speaking country doesn't necessarily mean that they are also not fluent in English. It's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so I highly encourage um, Data USA use, it's great to kind of give you an overall um, just look at your communities. You can also search by county. You can also search by uh, state. Oh, no, something happened with the web page. Let's see. Let's see if we can reload it. There we go. Like I said, you can search by county. You can search by state. Um, you can search by city. So I highly encourage you guys to uh, take a look at Data USA to kind of get you know your finger on the pulse of your communities that you may want to reach out to. Okay, so let's see. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Stop sharing. Here we go. Let me get my PowerPoint back up here. Do, do, do. Okay, so 
get to know your community. Thank you, Eva Raison from the Brooklyn Public Library. This is a great um, list of resources for people. Sorry. Oh, and speaking of advertising and getting the word out about your program, I just put together a quick little um, sample flyer. I made this on Canva. Um, ND Public Library Summer English Conversation Class. I have the same information uh, right under it in Spanish. June through August, every Tuesday night, 5 to 6.30 p.m. Again, right under it in Spanish. Ages 18 and over, all speaking levels welcome. Again, under it in Spanish. So what I encourage, um, if you've never really done a conversation class before or any sort of ESL workshops or anything like that, I encourage to you to think about, you know, who do you want this conversation course um, to be for? Like, who do you want to attend it? Um, is it going to be for high school English language learners? Is it going to be for adults? Is it going to be for older adults? Is it going to be for anyone, all ages? Think about that. Make that specification on your flyer. Um, let's see, be sure to have your dates and your times and, of course, contact information as well. Okay, now we're going to talk about registration. So, we have registration. If you Google ESL conversation classes or how to construct conversation classes, it is very likely that you will see tips or examples of class registration forms. In my opinion, there are some pros, but very possible and permanent cons to registration. And some of the pros are that you'll be able to gauge the number of partic participants you'll have. And it's easy to keep track of who's who and kind of build a relationship. Again, registration can help you solidify details. If someone didn't catch all the details, um, you know, age requirement, time, date on your um, ESL conversation class flyer, you can reiterate those details on like a registration form. However, some of the cons are is how will people get the registration forms? How will people save a seat? Um, if someone has limited language ability, you know, are they really going to want to call up the library and have a conversation and sign up that way? Maybe they could. It's totally possible. They could do it. Um, but maybe they couldn't. Is the only way to get a registration form at the library? You know, do they have to turn in a hard uh, copy? Or do they have to just come to the library and sign up? Well, what if they have limited transportation access and they can't get to the library on the days that they would be able to register? What about on the internet? They can download a form? Or what if they don't have internet access at their house? Or what if they don't have a computer? It's just things to consider. And also, people may be intimidated by needing to register. We talked about that misconception of um, sort of uh, public facilities earlier. Um, people who aren't familiar with libraries and their services may be intimidated by needing to give a phone number and their full name. You know? So if you do have registration, um, keep personal details minimal. And look, if you have a strong um, relationship with your non-native English-speaking communities already, then I'd say have registration. It's great. But if you don't, and this is kind of your first time to test the water with a conversation class, maybe hold off on the registration. And some possible solutions for your first couple of classes, um, you may want to just make sure you have enough resources for maybe 10 or 15 more people than you would expect to attend. Um, because if you don't have registration, it will be a little bit more difficult to gauge the number of attendees you'll have. And for the first uh, class or two, avoid an activity that requires a strict number of tools and resources to participate, like a cooking class. Um, and be sure to have a couple of volunteers, you know, one or two on hand in case you have more patrons than you expect and you need help scaffolding the class. All right. Okay, so we've set up our conversation class. We've got patrons attending. So how do you kick it off? How do you get people to talk? Assuming this is kind of your first session, you'll want to introduce yourself, of course. Um, Warm-ups, introductions, name badges are great. Have people make their own name badges. 
tell them it's okay, keep it to first name only if they want to, and find out why people are there. This will also help you kind of sculpt future conversation topics. If you have, you know, 10 people in your class and they're all there and they're all there because they want to learn things that will help them in, you know, uh, employment advancement, then you can kind of take a note and sort of incorporate you know, terminology and activities that, you know, deal with employment and the employment process and the job application process. Um, again, talk a little bit about yourself and your library and the community. You can always have a couple games as an icebreaker. My favorite is Jenga. That's what I use with my ESL students. Um, a good rule is each time someone pulls a wooden piece, they have to ask a question to someone else. Also note, games aren't only restricted to serving as icebreakers. Let them become an integral part of your class. Um, and read the room. If you have a conversation class that is lively and people are engaged and this, it's student directed and you're not having to facilitate, um, let them keep going. Keep the snacks flowing and let your attendees keep chatting unless it has been specifically um, requested or an activity is specifically in demand and is crucial for conveying certain information. You can always save your activity for next time. Remember, Conversation classes, a big feature about them is that they're a little bit less structured and they're a little bit more free-flowing. The goal is to get students to converse with one another, self-direct and self-correct and correct one another rather than it being teacher-focused where the instructor is talking most of the time. Okay. All right, so conversation classes 101. Um, how do I get people to talk? Part two. So I believe in always having a little bit of a backup, um, the implementation of essential words and phrases. Um, these are crucial in times of communication breakdown. I always encourage having some resource printed out somewhere that students can have access to um, that have a list of phrases and terms that can help them if they hit a hard spot and the conversation that they're having kind of starts to break down and whoever they're talking to they don't understand each other. Um, so here's just some sample terms and phrases. Hello, how are you? My name is. I'm from. I don't understand. What does this mean? What is this? Please speak slowly. That's just some, that's just some uh, examples. Um, having these printed out and translated into the um, either translated or explained in a way that people can use them when they hit um, a communication breakdown would be really great because if you have two attendees speaking to one another and they can, you know, they have a little communication breakdown and they can pull out these words and phrases, they can self-correct and then, you know, keep the conversation going. That's awesome because what that means is you didn't have to step in and facilitate and they did it kind of on their own in their own conversation. Now, of course, you're going to have times when you do have to step in and facilitate and um, you may have a topic that is particularly complicated and, you know, students need a little bit help and need a little bit more help and the self-direction is a little bit harder. And that's fine. That's normal. Uh, but again, conversation classes, just to reiterate, are a little bit more free-flowing. It's more about student self-directed conversation, a little bit less structure. And again, that doesn't mean you can't have activities and you can't introduce vocabulary and you can't... Um, introduce grammar. You can do all that. You can conduct review. But it's just supposed to be a little bit more loose and a little bit more social. Okay? Okay, so conversation class ideas. What does a plan look like? So, if you Google um, ESL conversation classes, um, how to, I don't know, uh, make a lesson plan, you'll get a whole number of different examples. This is from my experience, these are just some things I like to keep in mind. Um, and I think they're things that are very much worth keeping in mind. So, and you don't have to list this out and do this exactly this way. Again, these are just things that I think are important to consider when you are starting to construct a theme or a topic for a conversation class. So, think about your goal. Think about key terms and possible challenges that students uh, may not understand or key terms that they may need to know or possible challenges they may face, okay? And think about an activity or two 
that you can use to help kind of facilitate that conversation and start up that conversation. So let's look. Conversation class, lesson plan number one. Our goal for our theme, our goal for this class is to help people learn how to express opinions. Well, what are some key terms that you need to know when you express an opinion? Um, what's some key vocabulary? What's some key language? What's some target language? Well, you need to know how to say I think or I don't think. You may need to know some adjectives. So those are just some things to keep in mind. Um, an activity to help facilitate this conversation is you could talk about a movie, or you could talk about a YouTube clip you could watch, or you could talk about a recent event, um, things like that. Let's see, let's look at conversation class, um, lesson plan three over here to the uh, right. To the goal for this theme for this class, let's say it's to practice applying for jobs, career enhancement. So what do you want to practice? Reading, writing job applications, okay? What are some key terms that people need to know? Well, they need to know uh, job application and employment related vocabulary. So some activities could be to just run through very quickly key vocabulary. And you could um, integrate how to uh, fill out an application and do a mock application and interviews. You can demonstrate that. And then you can have students kind of cooperate, do something cooperative and work together. Work together on one and do a mock interview with each other. Okay? So, when you want to construct a lesson plan for your conversation course, it doesn't have to look exactly like this. Again, these are just some things I encourage you to keep in mind. Also, keep in mind cultural differences, possible cultural differences um, that you may encounter. I encourage you to stay away from any topics that may be uh, particularly controversial. You know, if you accidentally happen to stumble upon that, um, just try and let the conversation sort of develop itself naturally, but just do your best to steer clear of um, staging any controversial um, topics. Okay, so this is just a little bit of a roadmap for you guys. You don't have to use it if you want to. I just thought it might be a good little addition so you know. Um, the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, this is their guidelines, their uh, map for speaking. Now they have their guidelines for reading, listening, and writing as well, but I just wanted to talk about speaking here. Okay, and each level, novice, intermediate, and advanced, actually does include an intermediate sublevel. I left it out because I just wanted to uh, give you guys a glimpse of the difference between low and high ability. So novice or beginner, novice or beginner, um, low. So someone who is beginner low has no real functional ability, but given time and cues, they may be able to exchange basic information like names, greetings, etc. But someone who's beginner high, they can manage a few formulative questions and can communicate regarding basic tasks, you know, a few common objects, and immediate needs. Someone who's of the intermediate low level, uh, they can do things like routine ordering food, they can talk about their self, maybe their family, very basic activities, uncomplicated, and just communication that's very straightforward. Intermediate high speakers, they can converse with ease and confidence when dealing with routine tasks and social situations. They can handle talking on a basic level about things like work, interest, etc. And advanced low speakers can speak in several communicative scenarios. They can talk about current events, public interest, politics, and can navigate tenses, time frames, and can be understood by native speakers. And advanced high speakers, they have a well-developed ability to speak with ease and can use communicative strategies like paraphrasing, illustration, and can self-correct errors. Now, again, you don't have to use these guidelines. You don't have to use this um, if you don't want to. I just wanted to kind of provide it in this webinar to serve as a roadmap. If you're thinking of doing an ESL conversation course and say you want to have a conversation course for uh, non-native speakers who are of 
let's say the intermediate low level. Well, now you have sort of the idea of what performance on the intermediate low speaking level looks like. Okay, so if it's convenient and if it helps you, this is a good kind of room, uh, roadmap from Actiful. But again, you don't have to use it if you want to. It's just kind of good information to help illustrate um, illustrate uh, different speaking levels. And if you go to the Actiful website, again, there's these levels for writing, reading, and uh, listening as well. Okay. So, things to keep in mind for your conversation class. If you have a large class, try to split students into smaller groups, especially if the program is relatively new. This can help keep anxiety levels about speaking low. And keep in mind sounds and sound level. It may be harder for participants to listen effectively if the classroom is loud or there are multiple people speaking to the whole group at once. Don't try to force anyone to talk. I know this seems like a really obvious point. And of course, we want to encourage all attendees to participate. We want to do whatever we can to make them most comfortable so that they'll participate. But remember that all of us, English language learners, native speakers, immigrants, US citizens, all of us have different life experiences. You may have a conversation class attendee who just wants to come and check out the library or see what services you have or see if the combo class is something they'd be interested in consistently participating with. And that's enough. If that's all they want to do, that's fine because you've met the goal of getting someone into your library and showing them that they have a place there. Also, um, it's very likely that you'll have attendees who have varying skill sets. If you have a conversation class that is attended for patrons with at least intermediate speaking levels uh, or intermediate speaking skills, you could have not only intermediate level speakers, but also advanced level speakers. You may have a group who have advanced speech skills, but beginner level reading skills, or vice versa. So just keep that in mind. Just because someone can carry um, a basic, you know, uncomplicated conversation doesn't necessarily mean that they can read or write on that same level. Um, they very well could and they probably can, but just keep that in mind. And conversation classes are not the place to stress about grammatical correctness. Conversation classes are for social conversation development unless your attendees are requesting um, you know, grammatical correctness and to be learning uh, strict grammar rules. Um, I say that if the overall meaning of a communication is understandable, don't worry so much about grammatical correctness. Of course, you know, gentle corrections are fine as long as the correction doesn't require too much time or attention, but ideally, let's let the students self-correct and kind of help each other. And another way to kind of help facilitate this is if you teach vocabulary, maybe in the beginning of each conversation class. Now, what I'm not saying is to pass out a list of 30 different vocabulary words, maybe just five or six, just kind of help build the theme, introduce kind of the theme of what you'll talk about that day, just introduce a little bit, voca a little bit of vocab. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is an awesome English language learning resource. It's on uh, the BBC's website. Um, Keep in mind that if you use these resources, they're totally free, but if you use them, this, this is an uh, 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 English website, a UK website, so there, you might run into every now and then a little bit of uh, difference in terminology, which you'll want to make clear if you use these in your classes, but I highly, highly, highly recommend that you use uh, Learning English from the BBC. It's great. It's great for ideas. It's got free resources and activities, and we'll go take a look now. I'll um, share my screen. I'll show it to you. All right, share desktop. Okay, hey Data USA, we're gonna leave you. All right, here we go. BBC Learning English, inspiring language learning since 1943. So here is their web page, and you can already see uh, from the get-go there's just a number of different resources and videos and all sorts of stuff. Okay, so you have everything from everyday English, um, the difference between lay versus lie, 
have a digital detox. This is a kind of cool intermediate level uh, topic. You've got grammar review. How do you ask questions in English? Adjectives and adverbs for the intermediate medium level. So here's an example. Like I said, a little bit of different terminology. I've got plain and chocolate biscuits. Biscuits in England is cookies, whereas biscuits in Mississippi are very much not cookies. Okay. Easy grammar guide, medium grammar guide, hard grammar guide. Then you have this grammar game show. Um, Tim's pronunciation workshop. Learn the sounds of English. Vocabulary. All sorts of different stuff. Okay. Well, like this right here. Business English. English at work. Introduction. Okay. English at work. The interview. All right. So let's take a look. Features. Um, there's all these different. Oh, look. English news reporting. English we speak. Six-minute English, pronunciation, drama, words in the news. Let's look at the different courses. Let's say we want to do something really introductory. Let's look at English my way. Unit 1, learning circles. Watch these videos and learn some English words and phrases to help you with everyday life. So these videos are only about 20 seconds long, and they come with a number of activities and a number of conversation um, starters. So let's look at session one, just for an example. So this woman starts, she gives us an idea of what a learning circle is or a conversation circle and how you can run one. So you can watch this video. Once you have a grasp on that, you can go to an activity. So this activity would be great to show um, your ESL conversation class. Samina and Aisha are at the school gates. Samina meets another mother at the school gates, but at first it goes wrong. Discuss these questions with your group. Okay? So you watch this video. It's about 20 or 30 seconds. You can do these uh, discussion questions with your ESL course attendees. And then there's also, there's also um, an activity with questions that you can answer. All right. Then there's a part two. And there's an activity and discussion questions with this video. Um, so this is a really, really good uh, resource if you just kind of want to kick off an activity. It involves a little bit of listening. It involves speaking uh, prompts. It's a really great uh, resource to incorporate into your uh, conversation course. Then there's English in a minute. Let's look at this. Oh, I like this. It's just different topics in English. So history versus story. The five different ways to use the word hard. Stop to do versus stop doing. Must versus have to. How to use the word wish. To and very, what's the difference? Person, persons versus people versus peoples. So some of these are a little advanced, but if you have intermediate or advanced attendees to your program, little things like this would be really great. And look, they all involve an activity. So these are great um, little lessons and little prompts to incorporate into your conversation course. I highly encourage you guys to look around BBC Learning English. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. So, just to wrap up, I said we'd talk very briefly about building resources in your library. So, say you don't really have the time or the manpower to introduce. Uh, a conversation class into your library. You know what? You can always start with just building up a small ESL or foreign language learning corner. Take a good look around at what you have. Do you have any dictionaries? Do you have any Spanish English dictionaries? Do you have any Chinese English dictionaries? You can start a nice ESL or foreign language learning corner and incorporate all sorts of stuff. Do you have any grammar books laying around? Um, what about some graphic novels that you could put into your uh, ESL or foreign language learning corner? Um, you can compile a list of online resources that your ELLs may find useful. 
if nothing else. Um, you can provide this list of resources in your English language and your ESL corner. And your ELLs in your library can self-direct and they can self-teach. Okay. You can also include citizenship information, legal resources, um, free legal resources for immigrants. You can include all of this in an ESL or foreign language learning corner. So just take a look at what you have and what you can develop. All right, and again, my name is Natalie Dunaway. I'm the Continuing Education Quarter Coordinator with the Mississippi Library Commission. If you guys have any questions about incorporating ESL into your library, give me a call. My number is 601-432-4057, and my email is ndunaway at mlc.lov.ms.us. So give me a call. We can talk, um, and I hope you guys took away some